would like to pray at this point in the service. Ask God to bless the message before I speak. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just continue in this spirit of worship, in this spirit of openness to your spirit. So Lord, uh, come and speak to us. Continue to show us your greatness, your beauty, and your love. Transform us into your likeness, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a beautiful, wonderful experience so far. Does anyone have the advancer? Perfect, thank you. A lot of speakers struggle to know what to do with their hands. And this is something I can hold on to to keep myself from being too uh, gestury with my hands. Uh, what a beautiful opportunity to come together and to hear such wonderful music and to sing together and to be blessed. You kind of never know what you're going to get when you come to Scottsdale Thunderbird. Uh, sometimes we have storm ministries here uh, or uh, children's church or other things, and uh, we have variety. That's what we do here. We have variety. And I bet you weren't expecting when you came here that you were going to learn the goal of life. Oh, yes. Yes, you are going to learn the goal of life today. Uh, well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that at least a little bit. I'm glad our young people are with us. Last week we have Children's Church and the kids have a, a wonderful program uh, over in our fellowship hall. Uh, there were 75 of them, kids and, and staff and uh, helpers, last week in Children's Church. So that was tremendous. But I'm glad to have the young people here in our service today. And um, you're going to have to reset this or do something because uh, it's not working for me. Thank you, Nassim. Um, but we are going to begin with a kids quiz. This is my tradition. I like to interact with the young people. And I see a couple of mostly reliable young men here now. I have just have kind of an open question for the kids. And, and if you've never done this before, if you're new here, this is just something I like to do to, to begin the service, uh, at least begin uh, my, my speaking portion of the service, just asking some very simple questions, trying to get some of our young people involved. Harper, I see you back there. Uh, I know you want to come out here because you always have something to say. The, the, the question is just very simple. What does the Bible say about how we can be happy? What are some of the things you can think of that God wants to give us to make us happy? Okay, Isaiah, I knew I could depend on you. Right over here, Isaiah. Come on, tell it to us. Playing with your best friend. Is that me? Oh, everybody. Oh, that's... So friends. Yeah, friends are part of what uh, gives us joy and happiness. Sure. What else? Come on, young people. You can think. I would love to have some of your... This isn't meant to be a trick question. What are some of the things that make you happy? Or what are some of the things that you think God has done? I see Ezra's hand over here, too. So we'll go to Adon and then Sean. Yeah, if you can. Adon. Helping. Huh? Helping. Helping. Helping makes us happy. I love it. Wonderful. All right. Do I have that right? Is that Ezra over here? Okay. Ezra, Sean is going to put a mic and you're going to tell us what the answer is. Uh, I was going to say candy. Candy? Oh, my. Oh, my. Is there a dentist in the house? I'm not sure. But candy, sure, sure. Food, can we say just food? Most of us enjoy food. Food's meant to be a blessing. Um, verse, yes. I'm so glad you're here. I, I missed it. Could you say it again? Did, vegetables? Who is this child? Vegetables make you happy? I... We've gone from candy to vegetables. We've lost, we've lost it here. Okay, a couple more, a couple more. Um, I see Abel here. Okay, go ahead, Abel. Broccoli. Okay, now you're just picking on me. Now you're just being silly. Can we get back on topic here? All right, Eric or, or Sebastian, is one of you going to? Seriously, guys, is there a, an answer you have? Playing soccer. Playing games, playing soccer, sports, being outdoors. <laughs> All right, Lissell is going to bring it home now. Lissell is going to tell us the deep theological, spiritual answer we've all been looking for. 
Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, oh my. We're going to go ahead and, and close this chapter of, of, of our opening here. But some great answers, young people. Thank you so much for sharing some of your ideas and your energy. You can give the uh, remotes over there to Dennis. Um, so yeah, God has given us so many things that he wants for our enjoyment and our happiness. Uh, I'm just going to tick off a few. I noticed none of you said families, kids, or anything like that. That's all right, you know. Uh, but uh, obviously our children and our families are meant to bring us happiness. This is Leah in the Old Testament. Happy am I. Women will call me happy. So she named her son Asher, which means joy or happiness. So uh, parents, children bring us happiness, don't they? All the time, every day, every moment, they bring us nothing but... No, yeah, we, even in those harder moments, you know, children, uh, they may drive us crazy, but we love them and we know they bring us joy. Uh, when you eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it'll be well with you. So when we eat, when we have the reward of hard work, we might even say success. That's meant to be good. When you get a good grade on a test, you worked hard on it or a project or a quiz, you should feel good about that. that that's a reward for your hard work. When you build something and you see its result, he who despises his neighbor sins, but happy is he who's gracious to the poor. I like hearing some of them say helping others. I think maybe that was a dawn. Uh, that said helping others. Uh, it, it should be a source of great joy when you bless and help others. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, brings good news of happiness. How many of you grew up singing this song? Any of you know this song? Oh boy, we got more to learn, don't we? Um, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. So obviously from a spiritual, biblical, kind of churchy uh, standpoint, Knowing that we're saved in Jesus Christ should make us happy. You ever wonder why so many Christians look like they've been baptized in pickle juice? Why, why don't we smile more? Why are we so afraid? You know, there was a time not too long ago where there was this general thought that, that if you enjoyed something, if you were happy, if you smiled, then it was probably wrong. It was probably an indulgence of some kind. So there was kind of this aura, especially if you come from certain backgrounds and ethnicities. I'm largely German and Norwegian um, is kind of my background. And, and, and in my grandma's house, which I love grandma, but you, 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 you realize that you had to have restraint. You never went too far with, with uh, uh, you know, showing emotions and things like that because that was, you know, uh, that was getting too overly uh, indulgent, but we should be joyful. We should understand that God has saved us. The New Testament uses the word blessing more than happiness, but it comes from the same word. In Mrs. Campos's class, third and fourth grade, these last two weeks, we talk, went through the Beatitudes. Those are all about things that are supposed to make us happy. John tells us obedience to God is, an, is a source of great happiness. Our faith, understanding who Jesus Christ is. The second coming is called the blessed hope in Titus. It is a source of happiness, knowing that uh, this world isn't our home and all the challenges that we face, while we need to navigate that and find our place and be involved, ultimately there's a better place that God is preparing for us. And that should be a source of great contentment and happiness. Amen? The Bible says just reading the book of Revelation is meant to be a blessing to us, but I think we can expand that to just studying our Bibles. We should feel happy when we read the stories of Jesus, when we read the articles of faith, when we see how God has led among the prophets and in the past, we should gain joy and happiness from it. And of course, we could spend a lot more time on this. This is just, um, this is just a little bit. So what is the goal of life? A father and a son were building a house, and they'd put the walls up, but they were setting the trusses. And as they would set each truss, the father would be on one end of the building, and the son would be on the other, and they would bring the truss up. And the father would look over to the son, and he would say, Son, are you happy? And he'd say, Yeah, Dad, I'm happy. And then they would nail that truss on, and they would move on to the next. They would slide it into place. And the father would look again at his son and say, Son, are you happy? Dad, I'm happy. They would nail it into place. And, and a, a, a child was walking by and heard this and saw this interaction between a father and son. And again, they would move the next truss over on the roof and he would hear the conversation. Son, are you happy? Dad, I'm happy. 
And he, was, he marveled at how interested the father was in the happiness of his son. That he just asked him repeatedly over and over, are you happy? And no matter how many times the son said, yes, dad, I'm happy. As they'd move that next truss over, there the dad would say one more time, son, are you happy? And this, this uh, child that was hearing this marveled and he went home and he told his father. He said, dad, how come you never ask me if I'm happy? Well, what are you talking about? And he told him this story. He said about this father that continually asked his son about his happiness. And the father, who happened to also be in construction, kind of smiled and said, well, that's a very lovely thing that that father and son had. But actually in construction, when you ask someone if they're happy, it means is everything aligned correctly? My dad was in construction. He, he, he loves this story. But the same principle can be understood that the father has great desire in our happiness. Let me ask you something. As a parent, those of you who are parents, those of you who can imagine maybe one day being a parent, um, we, would, we would say that we want our children to be happy, wouldn't we? Would we say that that's something is, is kind of like the primary thing we want our children? Now, we want our kids to be successful, right? We want them to be stable and successful and all those things. But can you be successful and not be happy? There are many people who have uh, riches, ha have comforts, that have abundance, but that doesn't mean they're happy. And so you can say, well, we want them to have a family. We want them to have success. We want them to have an education. But if you have all those things and yet you lack happiness, have you really found what you need? God is supremely interested. And by, by the way, when I say happiness and joy and things like that, I'm not talking about just the kind of external, superficial giddiness and gleefulness and, and, and glibness and things like that, but a deep-seated contentment and confidence in God's plan for your life and God's desire to change you and bring you into the eternal kingdom. That kind of happiness God wants for all of us. I think that this world is mostly calculated to make us unhappy. Um, and we could go through all kinds. Do you watch the news? When you watch the news, do you come away going, man, I'm so happy. Now that I've watched the news, my heart is filled with peace and joy. Is that, is that what happens? Um, you know, for me, politics is a little bit of an indoor sport and it's very divisive and I understand it. But um, and, and I'm not saying you can't have political motivations and advocacy and, and be happy. But how many people do you know that are highly invested in politics and are very happy? I, I don't see it too much. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but a lot of these things are just kind of designed to be controversial, adversarial, destructive, and divisive. How many of you are happy in traffic? Thank you, Lord, for this extra moment to sit at this traffic jam. Now I can enjoy your presence in this vehicle a little bit longer. Is that your thinking when you're in a traffic jam? As the person behind me is honking his horn and right, bless them, Lord. They're in a bigger hurry than I am. Most of, of this world is not calculated for our joy. This is why we have the blessed hope. And we have opportunities in this world to be a source of, of joy. I, I, I was studying, uh, last week I ended by reading a passage from Philippians talking about the great uh, heroes of the day of, of January 13, 1982 and the tragedy of Air Florida Flight 90. And, and I talked about the, the graciousness and the self-sacrifice of so many who did heroic acts that day and ended with the, oh, excuse me, the story of Arlen Williams and, and him passing the rope. So I've been studying a lot of Philippians, and I was, I was uh, uh, remarking at some of the editor's notes, and the editors used in, in, in my Bible this, this title, The Goal of Life, The Goal of Life, and it caught my attention. And they started it right here in Philippians 3.1, so I thought that was very interesting. So I want to just have us reflect on this verse for a minute from Galatians 3.1 and this idea of it being the goal of life. Paul writes these words. Now, this is Philippians chapter 3. If you don't know, there are four chapters in Philippians, so we're dead in the middle. He's already covered two chapters. He's got two more to go, but he begins in typical preacher fashion with the word finally. He's in the middle of his sermon. He's still got two hours to go, but he says, but finally, you know, it's like when the pastor says, I'm almost done here, folks, and then you're like, oh yeah, we know you got another half hour in there. So Paul does the same thing here. He says, finally, but he ain't nearly done yet. 
But he is drawing this into a supreme focus when he uses the word finally. He is drawing everything he shared from the previous two chapters about uh, the, the, the attitude of Christ and the blessings and benefits of us growing in the image of Christ and the sacrifice of, of Jesus who emptied himself and, and all of these beautiful things that he shares in the previous verses. And he draws it to a singular uh, idea here when he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, um, where was Paul when he wrote these words? Do any of you know where his location was at this time? This is one of the prison epistles. He's literally sitting in a Roman jail. And he's writing these verses and he's writing these letters and he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And to write the same thing again is no trouble for me. He said, I'm not just saying this kind of because that's what I'm supposed to say because I'm the evangelist here. I'm the preacher. I'm supposed to say everybody be happy, okay? He says, no, no, this is deep. This is sincere. This is key to our identity and our understanding of a people that we of all people on earth should have a deep-seated peace and joy and contentment and happiness that flows through us. Notice he doesn't say be happy in the Lord. He actually uses the word rejoice. Rejoice means to express that happiness. It means it should be evident. It should be infectious. Have you ever known someone, a, a, a believer, but they, even people that don't pro proclaim our faith can have just a very a good atmosphere. But when they walk into the room, you just feel better. They just have an aura about them. You know, they just have a peace and a contentment um, without speaking a word, they just have a, 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 a selflessness and a, a service attitude that you just feel better. If you don't have a friend like that, uh, they're powerful. And I'm not saying everyone can be that or have that, but in a way, we are all called to be ambassadors of the peace and joy of God in every circumstance that we are. Yes, even in traffic. Even in traffic. Um, I had a youth pastor, uh, you know, I come from the bumper sticker generation. It used to be a much bigger thing to have bumper stickers. You don't see it as much anymore, but um, it, it, in, in my context, everybody had bumper stickers. And he would say, I refuse to put a Christian bumper sticker on my car. His name was Steve. I say, Steve, why not? I was just learning to drive. You know, I'm a mid-teenager, 15, 16 years old, and I'm all into figuring out what kind of car. And I was thinking about all the bumper stickers, you know, the fish going the right way, you know, and uh, uh, Christians are, are uh, you know, uh, not perfect, uh, but they're forgiven. You know, all these little pithy sayings and stuff. And, I was, and he said, don't do it, Dave. Don't put a bumper sticker. I said, I don't get it. Why? He said, because you will drive bad at times. <laughs> you will cut people off. You will lose your temper. And I don't want them seeing that you're a Christian. And I don't want them seeing me. And I was like, So you notice, I don't have bumper stickers for being a Christian on my car, but I do have Seattle Seahawk bumper stickers. I guess that's okay. But our relationship with Christ and the joy that he gives us. Paul says this, and he, he goes on to say, he goes through the end of the, the book, uh, and again, we know that we sing these songs as children, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Paul, in this very you know, limited circumstance says, look, I, and he earlier says, I have found the secret to contentment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so he's talking to the Philippian church. He's talking to us today. And he's saying, look, what good is your faith? What good is the power of God in your life? What good is the transformational reality of Jesus Christ if it has produced no joy in your life? Are you missing something? Are we missing something? It should get into our experience. So I want to share with you um, a, a way of just summing this up, and I'm going to just summarize a few things. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time or read books, you've, you've heard lots of devotionals and sermons and stories and books about you know what the purpose of life is and, and how we as Christians should behave. And I'm just going to uh, go through these quick. The theologians love to hone in on just knowing the Lord, which, by the way, is fine. Uh, Paul himself in Philippians says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed into his death. Um, so yes, knowing the Lord. Jesus himself um, in, in John 17 uh, in his high priestly prayer says, um, 
uh, uh, that this is eternal life, that they may know God and Jesus Christ, who I'm sent. Jeremiah says, let not the rich man boast in his riches, or the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength, but let him boast, boast in this, that he knows and understands the Lord. So there's nothing wrong. This is not to be in conflict with these, okay, Miguel? I'm not trying to say these are wrong. I'm just touching that these are ways in which people have, and Christians have sometimes identified what the purpose of life is and the goal of life and how we're going to rejoice in the Lord. So knowing God in an intimate way, knowing God in a personal way, applying uh, the principles and character of God to our lives. Um, pastors and preachers, they love to go through the, we got to know our past, we got to know our present, we got to know our future, that we were sinners in the past, we were lost without grace. Then Jesus came into our lives and knowing that he's our savior and knowing that he's preparing for us a home, these are all beautiful things. The spiritual disciplines, okay, we need to have an active exercise of prayer life and fasting and studying our Bibles, meditating on the good things of God, worshiping and fellowshipping together, etc., etc. These are fine things, and I agree with them. We need them. Um, for the apologists like Ravi Zacharias and Alvin Plantinga, they boil it down to one word, worship. The goal of life is to worship. We even sing songs uh, like that. Um, you know, um, when I look into your holiness, another one, I don't know how many of us know when I look into your holiness. The reason I live, the, the song says, is to worship you. The reason I live. Um, and there's a lot of beauty and truth in that too, that our purpose is to come into a place where we understand who God is and we bow our hearts and we lift up our souls to God. But I'm going to share with you just one additional thing or one an, a, another way that I think Paul would agree with and I think is vital for our lives today. If we really want to have the ability to rejoice in the Lord and understand happiness and understand the power of God in our lives, it comes through the action of serving others in Christ. Serving others. And when you think about that, all the previous ones are, are, are in harmony with that. Because if you know the Lord, the, the Bible says that God is love. Well, what is love? Is love just a cushy feeling of warmth in, in your heart that you just mm, love? Or is love the giving of yourself, the sacrificial placing of others ahead of yourself? The Bible says, for God so loved the, uh, the world that he gave us Jesus Christ. He put us as the priority. He said, I am here to serve and send my son to be a ransom for me. What is our past? Our past is when we were sinners, when we were selfish. What is salvation? The breaking of selfishness in our lives and the reorient, reorienting of our hearts to see others as more important than ourselves. And how many of you are looking forward to a heaven where there's no selfishness, where service and placing others ahead of yourself is the natural for everyone. The spiritual disciplines are there to help us understand how we serve others. Worship is the placing of God first in our lives, of course. God comes first, but then our neighbor. And by the way, this is the act of service, not just the mentality. Some people say, well, I pay my taxes. I pay my taxes. I haven't yet, by the way. I have a few more days. Okay, tomorrow is the big day. I got to do my taxes tomorrow. So I haven't paid taxes yet, but, oh, I pay my taxes. That's my service. The schools get that money. The roads and the first responders and, and uh, all the subsidies, that's how I serve. I pay my taxes. Hallelujah. Beautiful. But I think it means much more than just these kind of natural inclinations and in the things that we do, but an active mentality of serving others. Serving others was what Jesus Christ did the best. And it was in that that Jesus had contentment and focus and confidence and joy. Joy. So let's just reflect on that for a minute. All these, and, and I know you're familiar with these verses. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. It's not about me. I'm here to serve the Father, to do the will of Him who sent me. Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That, if, we are, if we want to be like God, isn't this, if we're to be like Christ, isn't this what we're to exemplify in our own lives as well? To serve. I came that they may have life 
and have it abundantly. I'm here for them. I'm not here for myself. Sometimes when we look at Jesus Christ and we study and we think about the example of Christ, we tend to look at it kind of only in his own uh, personal life. We say he was such a wonderful guy. He never sinned. He never swore. He never lied. He never broke the Sabbath. He, 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 you know, he didn't do all these. And that is the high calling of the Christian. The high calling of the Christian is to keep your life pure. To keep it, to keep your plate clean and to keep your, your house in order and, and to keep your life, uh, in alignment with his, you know, his character. And we kind we tend to think of it in this isolated kind of singular way. And, and, and I think that that is a terrible, tragic mistake that unfortunately the church, uh, has got itself wrapped into that that is the measurement of our faith by simply not doing the sins that are common to us. And by having just simply a kind of a feeling of confidence, but I think if we stop there, and there, by the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting to live holy and, 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 and have the Spirit of God giving us peace in our hearts about uh, how we orient our lives. But if it stops there, if it stops there, is that what Jesus came to do just to, to be a holy individual? He came to bless people. He came to serve people. He came to raise up a generation of people. He died in the service of bringing us salvation. So in our lives, if we have not found a, a, a way to serve our community, serve our church, serve our neighbors, serve our family, if we're not finding ways through the Holy Spirit, through through our prayer life and our meditation, we say, God, I'm in your hands. I'm your ambassador. What do you want me to do? We all know what God wants us to be. But what does God want us to do? I have come that they may have life. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. By the way, His mission is our mission. Someone sought and saved me. Someone prayed for me. Someone brought me to church. Someone invested in my life. And we all have opportunity and, and uh, a calling to seek and to save and to be active in the service of God. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. God wants us to have full joy. And we cannot have full joy unless we are experiencing the blessings uh, uh, in a variety of ways too, but experience the blessings of also participating in the service of serving others through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and from God. Fixing eyes. Oh, I love how Hebrews says, talking about the great sacrifice of Christ. He says, we should fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter or finisher, some of your Bibles say, of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he says, I'm willing to go to the cross. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to give all. I'm willing to serve because I see at the end of this road the opportunity for those to be redeemed. And they're my children and I love them. I'm happy to do it because salvation and eternal life is at stake. The goal of life is to find that place where we understand who we are in Jesus Christ and that we are able to rejoice in His provision for us and be transformed into His likeness and His image and to be made servants, to be made servants, participants in the gospel work. Not just recipients, but participants in the gospel work. Como se dice participant? Participante. I now habla español. As the Holy Spirit transforms you into Christ's image day by day, the more you should be joyfully drawn to the loving experience of service and seeking to save those around you. I don't like to be fatalistic, guys. You know, Iran is threatening to directly attack Israel today. Shabbat. How quickly will the last days be upon us? I know we've been saying that for a generation. We, we see little inklings, pandemics, and other regional issues, and we say, is this it? Is this it? 
But the day will come. The day will come. The day will come when it's all going to be over. What do you want to be doing between now and then? So, are you happy? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much today. None of us have fully arrived and found uh, perfection or the ability to perfectly understand all these things. But Father, we know how much you love us. We know how much your grace is powerful in our lives to to change us into your image, Lord. But help us to not just simply stop with our own change, but help us to be filled with your spirit, to be your hands, your feet, your, your voice to a world that is being filled with other voices and being filled with other messages. God, we have limited time left. We don't know how much it is. Maybe it'll be a full generation again before the last day events come upon us. But Lord, we want to be faithful unto that day. Make us your servants. Place us into your work. Help us to investigate in our own hearts, what can I do to find that joy in service? Thank you, Jesus, for hearing us. Bless us this day in Jesus' name. Amen.